in the Monroe Dock. All right, okay, got it. Want us to mute? All right, team. That's yeah, it's probably we've best. Got a job to do. Let's go police the world. America. Yeah, America, Team <laughs> Team America, World Police. Um, so it's over 20 years since the uh, Twin Towers were destroyed in a terrorist attack. And last year was the final co chaotic withdrawal from one of the consequences of that attack, the war in Afghanistan. And this thing, this uh, talk today is uh, tonight is a look at how and why the United States felt the response to 9-11 was to embark on a 20 year war and an invasion of Iraq, as well as continued involvement in the Middle East and elsewhere. What is it in the history of the United States that has influenced it? It's now self-appointed role as world police force determining which states and organizations should be deemed friendly or terrorist. So we got the manifest destiny in the Monroe Death Doctrine. And that's a couple of quotes from the two uh, main architects of it. The Monroe Doctrine was first articulated by President James Monroe in his seventh annual message to the Congress on December the 2nd, 1823. The European powers, according to Monroe, were obligated to stop meddling in the Western Hemisphere and acknowledge it as a, the United States sphere of influence. Manifest Destiny was first used by President James Polk, who was 1845 to 49. And he put forward the idea that the United States should stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from sea to shining sea, as he put it. It was to embrace, it was, it was embraced by all who saw white Anglo-Saxon America as a civilizing Christian influence with the rightful claim to the whole continent, regardless of the long histories of the native peoples or other European powers that they uh, found there. These principles were firmly anchored in a long-standing and deep sense of special and unique American destiny, the belief that America is a nation called to a special destiny by God. The notion that there was some providential purpose to the European discovery and eventual conquest of the American landmass was present from the beginning. Both the Spanish and the French monarchs authorized and financed exploration of the new world because among other things, they considered it their divinely appointed mission to spread Christianity <laughs> by converting the natives. Coming later, the English and then British, and especially the New England Puritans, carried with them a demanding sense of providential purpose. The English colonists believed God had charged them with a divine and unique preordained mission. They saw their initial failure to fulfill their covenant with God as the reason for all the woes and turmoil that had occurred. Things like Prince Philip's War, which was against Native Americans, the witchcraft phenomenon, droughts and dreadful winters, etc. They interpreted them as signs and results of God's wrath due to their failings. However, in the midst of what later became known as the Great Awakening, 
that spread across New England and other British colonies in the 1740s, the idea that God had chosen them uh, for a special destiny was resurrected. And this idea was reformulated with the American Revolution and the establishment of the United States. Americans did not consider their new country to be simply another nation amongst nations, but a providentially blessed entity charged to develop and maintain itself as a beacon of their ideas of liberty and democracy to the world. The United States Constitution with the First Amendment of the Bill of, Bill of Rights also established a clear separation of church and state, expressly forbidding the institution of an established church. It was legally a secular nation, though at the same time a, delete, a deeply religious society, sustained by divine will, and whose citizens were expected to subscribe to the founding principles with religious-like devotion. What emerged was a particular form of cultural nationalism to which all true Americans, be they immigrants or born in the United States, or whatever their personal religious beliefs and affiliations were expected to adhere. The United States was unified by a set of spe specified doctrines inscribed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to which all citizens of the nation gave their allegiance. The new Republic had been ordained by God and endowed with a special mission to be the new city upon a hill, to shine a beacon of liberty on the world, and at times, if deemed necessary, to spread its form of democracy by force of arms to other parts of the world. The revolutionary leaders, especially George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, who are pictured there, were soon elevated to found, into founding fathers and the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were turned into almost sacred relics. The second uh, Great Awakening swept across the United States over the first half of the 19th century with the belief that the millennium, the sign of the second coming, was imminent. The vehicle that would bring forth this great event was the American Republic, thus conjoining the, the coming of the millennium with the spread and triumph of American liberty and democracy. The fusion between God's will and the nation's democratic character gave divine sanction to the United States and made the nation itself an instrument in the coming millennium. Moreover, especially in situations of conflict, it sustained the claim that God was on their God was on the side of the United States, and so that made it easier to demonize any foe. So first we have the Monroe Doctrine. Doctrine. As I said, President James Monroe's 19, 1823 annual message to Congress included a warning to European powers not to interfere in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere. This portion became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The United States was wary of European intervention in Florida, the Pacific Northwest and Latin America. In 1821, Russia claimed control of the entire Pacific coast from Alaska to Oregon. Rumors persisted that Spain, with the help of European allies, was planning to reconquer its former Latin American co colonies. European intervention threatened British as well as American interests. Britain had a flourishing trade with the new Latin American countries, which would decline if Spain regained its new world colonies. And, and it also had claims to territor, territory in the Oregon, Oregon country of the Pacific Northwest. In 1823, British Foreign Minister George Canning proposed that the United States and Britain jointly announce their opposite opposition to further European intervention in the Americas. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams opposed a joint declaration, 
he convinced President Monroe to make it a unilateral declaration of American policy. Monroe announced that the Western Hemisphere was henceforth closed to European colonization or puppet monarchs. He also said that the United States would not interfere in any internal European affairs, although at that time they had no little or no power to do so. This seemingly anti-imperialist statement did imply, though, that the United States now saw itself as the dominant power in the Americas. And for much of the 19th century, the United States actually lacked the military strength to prevent European intervention in the New World. So the Monroe Doctrine was actually enforced by the Royal Navy. Nevertheless, for the American people, the Monroe Doctrine became the proud symbol of American hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. Unilaterally, the United States had defined its rights and interests in the world. <clears throat> the Louisiana Purchase, the exp expansion of the United States was greatly enhanced by the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which nearly doubled the size of the country. However, although purchased from, French, from the French in a dubiously legal deal, they only had nominal control over much of the vast area of land, which was inhabited by Native American tribes. The US president at this time was Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers. He saw the purchase as a solution to what to do with the Native Americans one in which Indians would not have to choose between assimilation or extermination. The government could relocate Indians further westward while opening up any vacated lands for white settlement. Later, President Monroe expanded on Jefferson's ideas and beliefs on Indian removal in an 1825 address to Congress. He abandoned the idea that the Indians should be assimilated into white culture, and he argued that therefore it would be to the it would be to the benefit of the tribes to be removed from their lands for their own well-being. It was President Andrew Jackson who fully realized removal, pushing the policy into law. Jackson offered his own justification for Indian removal in December 1829 claiming that the removal was necessary for the preservation of American Indians, essentially asserting that removal was simply a humanitarian act for the good of the Indian tribes. However, removal was, was not met with gratitude or joy by the majority of American Indians forced to leave their homelands. American Indian participation in the removal was meant to be voluntary, and the act required that the US government had to negotiate fairly with the tribes, but this didn't happen. Many tribes were forcibly removed from their lands, in particular Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Chickasaw and Seminole. And this series of forced migrations became, uh, became known as the Trail of Tears. Under President Polk's manifest destiny, it became the motor for the expansion in the West. The nominally independent state of Texas joined the Union. Next, he manufactured a war with Mexico and large areas of Mexico, including California and New Mexico, were annexed. This huge increase in the size of the US which he rather bewilderingly uh, referred to as a bloodless achievement, was followed by asserting our title to the whole of the Oregon Territory, which was followed by a claim that the civilized world will see these proceedings in the spirit of liberal concession on the part of the United States. This did lead to the Oregon Treaty the following year, which divided the whole territory between Britain and the United States along the 49th parallel. But of course, all these things had uh, impacts on various people. Uh, as American settlers pushed westward into the new lands, 
they inevitably came in conflict with the Indian tribes. Although the threat of Indian attacks was quite slim and nowhere proportionate to the number of US Army actions directed against them, the occasional attack was enough to fuel the popular fear of the savage Indians. Ultimately, the settlers, with the support of local militias and later with federal government troops, sought to eliminate the tribes from the land as they desired. The result was devastating for the Indian tribes, which lacked the weapons and group cohesion to fight back against such well-armed forces. The manifest destiny of the settlers spelled the end of the Indian way of life. By the end of 1849, there were barely 500, uh, 650 Chinese immigrants living in the United States. However, as gold rush fever swept the country, Chinese immigration increased rapidly. By 1852, three years later, there was over 25,000 Chinese immigrants. And by 1880, over 300,000. Um, most of these immigrants lived in California. Prohibited by law since 1790 from obtaining US citizenship through naturalization, Chinese immigrants faced harsh discrimination and violence from American settlers in the West. Many of the immigrants got to the United States using a credit ticket in which their passage was paid in advance by American businessmen to whom the Im immigrants were then indebted for a period of work, just like indentured servants. Most new arrivals were men. Few wives or children ever traveled to the United States. Uh, and as late as 1890, less than 5% of the Chinese population in the US was female. Few Chinese immigrants intended to stay permanently, although many were forced to do so as they lacked the financial resources to return home. The treaty that ended the Mexican-American Mexican War, as mentioned earlier, in 1848, promised US citizenship to nearly 75,000 Hispanics living in the American Southwest. But the massive influx of Anglo-American settlers simply overran the Hispanic populations that had been living there. Despite being US citizens with full rights, Hispanics quickly found themselves outnumbered, outvoted, and ultimately outcast. Corrupt state and local governments favored whites in land disputes, and mining companies and cattle barons discriminated against them in terms of pay and working conditions. And in growing urban areas such as Los Angeles, barrios or clusters of Latino working class homes grew more isolated from the white American centers. And just uh, later than this, finally, Alaska was purchased from the Russian Empire. Once again, the sale was actually disputed by the indigenous groups who lived there, who argued that they had never given up the land in the first place. Guano, <laughs> bird droppings. Under pressure from uh, a growing population, profitable cash crops, reduction in yields and extended industrialization, the amount of food produced by American farmers was falling well short of what was required. The solution was the import of nitrogen rich guano, after nearly causing a war with Peru, the US government passed the Guano Islands Act in 1856. Under its terms, whenever a US citizen discovered, a gu discovered guano on an unclaimed, uninhabited island, that island would, at the discretion of the president, be considered, a, considered as appertaining to the United States. This was important as it established that the United States would now expand beyond the North American continent. The working conditions on these islands were harsh and the workers were mostly recruited from African-American and other minority groups under the false promise 
that they would be living in a tropical island paradise. By the end of the 19th century, the United States was looking beyond these small islands and the doctrine of manifest destiny was extended to include the non-developed world. With European nations expanding their colonial possessions, there was a feeling amongst the American elites that they were missing out. Opportunity arose with the one European empire that was in terminal decline, the Spanish. There had been an ongoing independence struggle in Cuba on and off for years. After an onslaught of anti-Spanish propaganda in the American press, and the blaming of the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor on the Spanish, the US declared war on Spain. The Spanish-American War lasted 16 weeks between April and August 1898. And although ostensibly waged to liberate Cuba, American forces also invaded other Spanish territories, including the Philippines, where they were joined by Filipino rebels. A Philippine Republic was declared with the defeat of the Spanish forces, but peace negotiations between the US and Spain excluded the Filipinos. The United States annexed the Philippines, as well as Guam and Costa. To Rica. Likewise, talks over Cuba excluded the Cubans and led to a, an initial occupation by the United States in the form of a protectorate. Also, the Re Republic of Hawaii, which was established a few years earlier by a coup d'etat by foreigners supported by an invasion of US Marines, was also formally annexed in part to secure a naval base at Pearl Harbor. After the assassination of President McKinley in 1901, Vice President Theodore Roosevelt became, succeeded him and un, under him, the Monroe Doctrine was uh, refined. It was now explicitly stated that the United States claimed the right to intervene in any Latin American or Caribbean state that they saw as endangering American political or economic interests. The immediate aftermath of this was the intervention in 1904 in the Dominican Republic. These interventions and conflicts became, were largely economic in nature and they became known as the Banana Wars because of the connections between the US interventions and the preservation of American commercial interests in the region, especially the United Fruit Company that had significant financial stakes in the production of bananas, as well as tobacco, sugar cane, and other things throughout the Caribbean and Latin America. They collaborated with the Colombian government to suppress Panamanian rebels seeking autonomy. They then switched sides uh, and supported the newly formed state of Panama through a treaty that allowed the creation of the Panama Canal Zone. That zone, the United States, would, was where they would build uh, the canal and then administer, fortify and defend it, as they said in the treaty, in, perpetu in perpetuity. That, and that, that's, that's a list of all the various um, interventions, troops, bombing, naval, whatever. So that... That takes us up to the First World War. And after it, after the U US had uh, come into it for the, the last few months or so, it retreated into isolationism. They refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles or join the League of Nations, which was actually the idea put forward by their President Wilson. However, it was impossible for the United States to withdraw completely from world affairs because American possessions now stretch from the Caribbean to the Pacific. And the First World War had transformed the country into the world's leading creditor nation. All, all the allied powers 
especially Britain and France, hold huge sums to the United States, who, when asked, refuse to waive any of the debt. Also, Germany had to pay reparations to the Allies uh, in, in accordance with the Treaty of Versailles. But because of the economic depression, we're defaulting. The solution was for the US to make huge loans to Germany, who then could pay the Allies, who then paid the US. So it was a win-win all along there. Oh, skipped a few there. That's it. <laughs> then later, the Americans dev devised the good neighbor policy. The policy of police in Latin America continued, but there was a different approach. Beginning with President Hoover in 1928 and continued by President Roosevelt, the new President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the new good neighbor policy was adopted to improve relations in the region. American troops were drawn from Cuba in, in 1933 and Haiti in 1934. Nonetheless, even with the, this non-intervention approach, American foreign policy in the region continued to support conservative governments that protected US economic interests. After the Second World War, uh, well, isolation actually ended with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. But after the, the, the war was over, as it was drawing to a close, the United States were formulating their post-war foreign policy, with the result being the Truman, Truman Doctrine, announced by President Truman in 1947. This stated that the United States would intervene to support any democratic governments if they were threatened by totalitarian ideologies, i.e. Soviet communism. In reality, it became a policy to prop up friendly governments, no matter how undemocratic or corrupt they were, against popular revolts. The US also realized the need for economic stability in Europe, and unlike after the First World War, where they demanded uh, all repayments, they pumped money into war-torn Western Europe. Prior to this announcement, the United States had already begun interventions in Korea and China. In Korea, they landed troops to establish the United States Army military government south of the 38th parallel. In China, the Japanese Army of Occupation was rearmed to support the US-backed Kutaman against the Communist People's Liberation Army. This was followed in 1947 by financial and military aid to the Greek Conservatives in the civil war that had been raging for two years to defeat the Communist Partisans. A year later, CIA resources uh, conducted a dirty tricks campaign and millions of dollars were poured into the Italian general election to prevent the election of a left-wing government. So that, that is U US interventions before and after 1991. Um, if you look at those distributions, of the 392 US military interventions since 1800, reported by the Congressional Research Service in October 2017, by 50 year increments, the data shows a dramatic increase from 39 in the first 50 years, rising each year to 126 in those last 17 years which you know, is compared to the 50 years of all the previous periods. And it, it should be noted that these military interventions 
Uh, that's all the I. It doesn't include any covert operations or financial support for military coups, etc. And of course, in the last four years, Syria, Yemen, Bolivia and Venezuela can be added to that list. There was various methods used, economic blockades on Cuba still going on since uh, the Cuban missile crisis in Iran. Uh, arming and advising anti-government forces, supporting military coups, terror tactics again in Cuba, false flags like the beginning of the Vietnam War, uh, the illegal bombing in Laos and Cambodia, and numerous times troops and invasions. And added to that in the last decade or so, we've had the uh, new idea of drone strikes, which have hit those Afghanistan, especially Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, and Libya. Ah, Tan Tanamo Bay. This is from the report that I uh, put on the WhatsApp group. Well, Guantanamo Bay, as probably everyone knows, is a site of American naval base and detention camp on the island of Cuba. The United States assumed territorial control over the southern portion of Guantanamo Bay under a 1903 lease. The United States exercises jurisdiction and control over this territory, while technically they recognize that Cuba retains ultimate so sovereignty. The government of Cuba regard the US presence in the Guantanamo Bay as, as an illegal occupation on the basis that the original Cuban-American treaty uh, was, quote, obtained by threat of force and is in violation of international law. The Americans actually uh, send money to the Cubans for using Guantanamo Bay, but the Cubans have never ever cashed the checks, as it were. And it's now 20 years since the arrival of the first terrorism subjects at Guantanamo Bay, which happened on January the 11th, 2002. They were categorized as unlawful combatants who, according to the Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld, do not have rights under the Con Geneva Convention. Actually, they do, but um, the, the, the term unlawful combatants combatants isn't actually a legal term. On January the 9th this year, a report was released by the Watson Institute of Public Affairs based at Brown University, uh, which is a, they're a leading research university in Providence, Rhode Island. So that this, this is a, a leading research academic university, you know, not, um, not just any you know, it is backed up by uh, proper research methods. And it notes, to quote, with the participation of at least 54 governments, the CIA secretly and extrajudicially transferred at least 119 foreign Muslims from one country to another for their, for incommunicado detention and harsh inter interrogation at various CIA block sites. At least 39 of the men were subjected to waterboarding, walling, rectal feeding, which is a form of rape, and other forms of torture. The US military also held thousands of foreign Muslims, security detainees and prisoners of war, including some women and boys, at its detention centers abroad, including Abu Ghraib in Iraq, Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan and its naval base at Guantanamo, and also subjected many to physical and phys physiological abuse. So as of today, there are still 39 being detained in uh, Guantanamo Bay, and 27 of them have never ever been charged. No US government officials have been held accountable for creating, authorizing, or implementing the CIA's secret detention and torture programs. A heavily redacted summary of the 2014 US Senate's torture report, as it became known, 
on the covert CIA program that was released made clear that the torture was both useless in producing actionable intelligence as it was brutal. President Biden, like Obama and Trump before him, has shown no inclination for releasing the full report, much less criminally investigating those behind the rendition, detention and interrogation program or any other post-September 11th abuses. Biden also opposes allowing the International Criminal Court to include abuses by US nationals in its investigation on grave human rights crimes in Afghanistan. Abroad, the US has continued abusive practices against terrorism subjects, including transferring them to countries that torture, and at least some cases unlawfully detaining them at a US run sites abroad or at sea. The report also states, uh, I quote, although such US detention related counterterrorism violations have dramatically decreased, Washington has replaced capture with kill, conducting airstrikes often with armed drones that have killed thousands of civilians, including including outside recognized battlefields. Its counter-terrorism campaign has spread to 85 countries with scant transparency, transparency or oversight. So, the conclusion. The deployment of US armed forces to other countries is not even distributed. It, uh, distributed, but that's the first thing. And in fact, it's highly skewed in terms of frequency to favour the historical per, uh, period following the end of the Cold War in 1991. Secondly, the US mit military intervention since World War II have only rarely achieved their intended political objectives. That is, the United States has lost more than it's won. And when it has won, it has generally won at a cost far in excess of what would have been considered reasonable prior to the intervention. And this leads to a, a conundrum. If US military interventions are failing more often, and given that the ideological justif justification for intervention has largely disappeared with the fall of the USSR, what accounts for the dramatic increase in their use since 1991? If the United States only intervenes with armed force when its vital interests are at stake, why intervene more often when there are arguably fewer vital interests at stake? And I think we have to go back to American exceptionalism that has existed from the earliest days of the country's founding as, as laid out. And given the growing cultural and economic hegemony of the United States, it's resulted in even greater hubris, which has developed to encompass the whole globe. Other factors could be that something structural in the US calculations tends to concentrate assessment of risk and benefit into short-term horizons, explaining both unwarranted optimism and high failure rate. The short-term benefits of a conflict can quickly disappear as the situation escalates into long-term war, which in retrospect appears irrational. Uh, the increased military, uh, yeah, increased military spending has also had a knock-on effect that needs to be justified. If there are all these troops and new equipment and, and new uh, technology, they need to be deployed and used. This then increases military spending again, and so the cycle repeats. The US outpaces all other nations in military expenditures. World military spending totaled more than $1.6 trillion in 2015. 
The US accounted for 37% of the total and US military expenditures are roughly the size of the next seven largest military budgets around the world combined. Another thing is the small cost of failure. Given the extraordinary reach and size of American armed forces and the relative ge geopolitical isolation of the continental United States, the level of an existential threat is tiny compared to the possibility of success however small. Military interventions don't appear to entail a serious risk to US sovereignty or security, but can have benefits for political and economic elites and gives the impression of looking tough. This far outweighs the costs and risks of failure, which can almost always be blamed on factors beyond their control or on political opponents or third parties. Those elites in America never pay the costs. The United States does not view itself as an aggressor state, but the United States has become both more interventionist and less likely to use its supposedly core, core principles of opposing genocide, e.g. Rwanda and Darfur, and abiding by the rule of law, Guantanamo Bay, etc. It has fought two fantastically costly wars, won neither, and then insisted that Iran not acquire, acquire the means to defend itself. Allies and adversaries alike may, may therefore be forgiven for reimagining the United States as an aggressor and possible threat to the international order. I uh, will finish with this. Well, please get down on the ground. Hey, terrorist! Terrorize this. Make this interesting. Kia! Everything is boom. We stop the terrorists. 